Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony, for opening the day with a, such a thought-provoking presentation. Please stay with us because there's a lot to discuss in our, uh, in our panel right now about the premium publisher advertising business model. And I'd like you all to join me in, in welcoming uh, to the panel, along with Anthony, uh, Miley Chevalier, the Director of Innovation and Digital Product at the Vocento Group, uh, Nick Welsh, the Head of Programmatic and Publisher Development at Integral Art Science, Augustin Ducré, the Managing Director for Southern Europe at Index Exchange, and I think joining us uh, from Dublin, Claire O'Flynn, the Head of Agency Solutions uh, at the Irish Times in the Irish Examiner Group. So welcome all and, and thank you for, uh, for being uh, with us today. It's, this is where you say grab your seats and you actually mean it. <laughs> Hi Claire, can you hear us well? I think you're on mute, which you're not. I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure we'll fix it. Anyway, have a seat, please. All right. Whoops. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you, Anthony, again for the presentation, and thank you all for taking the time uh, to be with us today, either physically uh, or virtually. Originally, I had intended to start with, with a general question about, you know, in the era of subscriptions, you know, how important is, is it advertising? Is it a twin pillar of revenue or is it, uh, you know, a complementary, you know, stream? But I think that most people uh, would tend to agree that advertising still remains distinctly important for the, uh, for the overall picture of the publisher revenue stream. And given that, uh, as ever, we are tight on time. I wanted to immediately, you know, delve further, unless, of course, you want to have in your answer an introductory comment on, on this, but if publishers are going to be making clear, substantial, and sustainable progress in terms of the advertising marketplace, which is, you know, what are the assets on which a new strategic paradigm can be built upon? Is it, let's say, first-party data? Uh, is it context? Is it you know, the, the supply chain quality issues like, you know, viewability and ad fraud, all the amazing work that premium news brands have been doing over the last few years? Is it new quality KPIs? Is it scale, alliances? There's so many to touch upon. And I will not start with you, Anthony, because I think you've had a reasonable amount of time mm -hmm. this morning. And perhaps, my lease, you may want to go first uh, in an introductory comment and what you think the strategic assets publishers can leverage uh, are in the, for the near future. Yes. Um, first of all, I would like to, to confirm that uh, definitely advertising remains actually a key strategic part of the publisher strategy, definitely. Uh, along with the subscription, which is, uh, as, you, as Anthony described very well, a very strategic part for, for us. Uh, perhaps just to put you in the context of the Spanish market, uh, last year the subscription business actually has covered like 3 billion euros, which is not that far from our 4 billion in digital ads, and is supposed to grow to 2025 at 8 billion. Um, so of course this is all subscriptions. Uh, across sectors, car, um, I would say, uh, food, beauty, etc., and I would say 80% uh, of the of the Spanish people have at least one subscription, but not even 20% have a subscription in the media field. So, which means that uh, along with subscription, advertising keeps having a very important part. And our strategic, I would say, uh, direction to, to answer your question a little bit more precisely uh, is to link uh, efficiency with uh, premium uh, environment, with premium inventory. And I think Anthony has made just an excellent demonstration, so I won't be explaining it again. 
but to, to boil it down at the reality of Vocento, I would say, first of all, uh, we are working on having a better control on our inventory. So we are currently uh, moving from uh, Google to Smart Ad Server. Uh, second, we are actually taking care of the quality of our, the, of our supply chain, which means not only, uh, I would say, uh, using the ad verification uh, technology like IAS for brand safety, but also for contextuality. We are currently actually uh, making quite a lot of experiment in that field. And, uh, and also very important is working on viewability, as you were also mentioning, uh, which enable us to uh, have actually high CTR and being able also to be more attractive on the CPC field. So we are now on a 68-70% uh, average in terms of viewability. We are working also on focusing on three art formats, with, which are native video and branded content. And um, last but not least, the first party, which is important as well. But it's true that our focus uh, is very much on subscription uh, and on uh, content consumption. Uh, regarding advertising, uh, I would say strategy, we are very much joining forces with the data of our advertisers and our uh, agencies. And also working now currently partnering with a new, I would say, big organization to join forces in terms of first party, which we will be telling more perhaps in a couple of months. Okay, so there's news to expect then, yes. I imagine. Yes, now, and also perhaps, if you just allow me, please. But because there's not so much news in terms of new product launch in the publishing business sometimes, we are more into diversification. But we just launched a new media uh, brand, which is Relevo. Uh, this is a sports brand. And this brand is definitely an advertising platform. Yeah. Well, sports, there's an interesting little game taking place on Saturday, uh, which I'm sure plenty of Madrilenos will be watching. Uh, so I, it's quite timely <laughs> uh, in, terms of, in terms of sports. Now, Nick, my list did an unintended pass. Uh, by, by mentioning, um, <laughs> by mentioning, how you guys work with with publishers. So a first comment from you as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think before I do that, I want to congratulate Anthony on a fantastic presentation, um, and also I think you've recently announced an increase in your subscriptions to 725,000. I think. And your operating profits are up 33%. So I think we should be un under no illusion that quality media is healthy um, and that, you know, that quality journalism is still at the forefront, um, both for consumers and for advertisers. Um, and to the point you were making just now, I think what we want to be able to do is surface quality media both for our publishers and also for our advertising partners at scale so they can make more informed decisions about how they optimize um, both efficiencies um, and advertising revenue potential. And, and the best way to do that is through leveraging data. Um, and I think focusing on, on those signals so that we can understand how viewability impacts conversions, for example. We did a test with a, um, a finance advertiser fairly recently where we drove conversions by 43%. Um, which is fantastic. Um, also, we recently looked at how publishers need to, and, and, and brands need to leverage insights to make smarter decisions. And the, the great thing about a publisher is they have access to fantastic assets. And we shouldn't forget that a publisher is a media vehicle to the consumer, and the publisher understands the consumer very well. I mean, it's their job to, to give information to the consumer. Uh, but it's also their responsibility to ensure that um, they offer advertisers responsible um, advertising opportunities through suitability, as was discussed earlier, uh, leveraging context, marrying context with first party data to create new opportunities. We partner with um, News UK in the UK, who built their own first party data platform called Nucleus and they leverage our contextual data, data signals, not just for curated supply with it through their ad server to the buyer, but also into the DMP themselves. So we're really, IAS is very much about, you know, driving quality media opportunities both for the publisher and the advertiser to create a, 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 a much more um, engaging ecosystem. 
Thank you, Nick. I want to go and check whether we fixed the issue with Claire's sound. I think so. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Well, Great. Good morning. Good morning, Claire. Your viewpoint on... Uh, you did hear the question, didn't you? So I heard... Um, I'm, not, I'm just not sure if it's the subscription question no, or it's, the... No, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a question. It's, it's the question about the... Uh, what are the main strategic assets... From, for, you know, for premium publishers, uh, you know, yeah. the first party data, context. Um, Perfect. I, I, I've got it. Yeah, okay. I wasn't sure because I only heard a little bit of it. But um, I guess from my point of view, um, that there's no sort of silver bullet here. Um, it's a sum of various assets uh, working in harmony, I, I believe, that helps us deliver a more compelling and effective proposition to our advertising clients. So, for example, sort of first party data for niche audiences without scale. Um, can be of little value. Um, context um, has always been a staple with premium publishers. Um, I was looking back um, at how many years I've been in media, but I've been selling <laughs> context my whole career. So this is sort of nothing new, really. Um, but I guess the uh, targeting capabilities um, have evolved as we have from traditional press offering into the digital world. Um, and the vendors that we work with um, enable us to offer more sophisticated, contextually relevant targeting. Um, partners such as Oracle Data Studio and, and Video Intelligence. Um, these partnerships, we have uh, maximized those capabilities. And then, as mentioned just then, overlay, overlaying this uh, with our own unique first party data, uh, we feel makes for a really powerful targeting solution. And then being gold standard certified, you know, to give advertisers reassurances of the quality of the inventory that they're buying, um, and also being transparent with our first party data. That's becoming more and more increasingly important. Um, and we're trusted news brands. So, you know, the trust that we have with our editorial, um, I truly believe needs to run right through to our, to our advertising solutions. Um, and then scale, of course. So in Ireland at the moment, we don't, we don't have an alliance of sorts, um, but we're building a network um, now. We've, we've identified where, where we sort of had gaps in our reach um, and we've acquired um, uh, media groups and, uh, and also onboarded some new regional partnerships. So again, sort of growing that, that scale and, and reach for advertisers. Um, and excitingly, we've got, we've got more um, sort of first party news on the way um, soon um, with the introduction of our new uh, DMP. Thank you, Claire. Augustin, the, the view from Index Exchange. In two words, uh, just to answer to the first question, Yes, uh, advertising is still a very important source of revenue, and we, it will remind, you know, just for, not only because we need, I mean, I'm talking about publishers, we need it on uh, an economic point of view, but it will still grow, you know, in the coming years, but also as a user, uh, I need advertising. I have discovered so many good products for advertising, so advertising is also content, so we need this part of the discovery, and as a user, I need it. Um, there is something that we miss, I think, as an industry, is the user, the relationship that we have with the user and the win-win agreement, the win-win deal that we have you know, through advertising. So uh, if you look at advertising, you have an access to free open web. So I think something, there is something that we need to do on this point of view. Uh, the French market is facing this, you know, uh, I don't know if you are aware, but the concert in France is a bit different than the concert that we have in other countries they put accept and decline at the same level. And as a consequence, we have seen that the positive concerns has dropped significantly by 30%. So it means less inventory. So many publishers are facing this problem and are educating the market saying that, okay, it's a good deal, you know, it's a win-win situation in between what you, you, you will have if you look at advertising. <coughs> and talking about the opportunities about the market, there are, I won't treat the, the first party uh, data because we talked about this already, but there are three main opportunities for us in the market. First, uh, the resolution of the end of third-party cookie and the alternative that it will bring to the market, and there are many opportunities. The, also, the optimization of the programmatic chain, there is a lot to go there, and also the rise of new channels like CTV. You talked about CTV previously, and yesterday we talked uh, about the opportunity. I will address two, uh, the addressability. So we are all working on alternative to the end of third-party cookie, but as a publisher, and uh, we see that there are two different worlds. The do my, oh, does it work? Yes. Okay. Do my user log in or do not log in? And it makes a lot of difference. And whatever the solution that you, you, you use afterwards, if there are 
logged in, it means that they will have a better user experience. It will mean that the advertiser will have a also a better user, uh, better experience. You can like address this user, whatever the device, whatever the browser. You can address also branding and, and advertising KPIs like frequency capping, etc., etc. So the, the experience is much better. But as also a, a media owner, it gives you a much better value out of this. And the second point, just into words. <laughs> no, no, I, please go ahead. Right. It's fraud and ad quality prevention. And we are both in the same boat, you know, the ad tech uh, providers and the media owners. We need to double down on this. It's super important to guarantee the, to the advertiser that we are bringing this. It's one of the blockers and one of the headwinds that we are facing, especially on new channels, new channels like CTV. So we need, and also as an industry, as a whole the association, we need to, uh, to double down and add quality and, and fraud. Into yeah. cool. Anthony, now from the, the things that you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, you guys. Uh, have tried more, more or less all of them, so I don't want you to go through the presentation again. <laughs> the question that I would ask, you know, from all of those innovations that you showed, which one, which one gave the most immediate positive reaction from brands? Because they all work in the same direction, they all have been effective, but which was the one that you said, oh, you know, this, this thing really works? Um, I think different brands respond to uh, different things. So there are certain brands that are really focused on driving brand impact, um, and they responded really well to us bringing in a kind of uh, an, a, an affordable and accessible um, tool that allowed them to demonstrate and, and measure that brand impact. There are other brands that are really have a lot of sensitivity around brand safety, and, and that's a kind of a big um, kind of area of focus for them. So us being able to demonstrate that we knew our website inside out and could really kind of have good control over that was, was also um, really positive to them. I would say for me, for me personally, the big win was um, using the lessons that we learned through COVID around how we can sell hard news that is crucial and needs to be funded in a time of crisis or when a topic is particularly sensitive and actually getting to the point where advertisers laid down money to be against that content because they trusted the content was at a suitable level in terms of quality and that it was relevant for them. That for me was the big win and I really want to just see that ball continue to sort of roll um, and, and that to continue to build um, because it is the number one issue that quality news publishers face is that brands are happy to put their money against a documentary you know, on Channel 4 about a really sensitive subject or sit in a premium slot on the 10 o'clock news. But when it comes to digital online news, for some reason, there's bl these blanket blocks in place and it's just not fair. Um, so that for me is the big, the yeah. big win. That was not a win only for the Telegraph, it's probably a win for society as a whole, one way or Hopefully, argue. yeah. Now, historically, you know, or in, in the recent past when publishers were looking at the uh, principal drivers of advertising revenue, they would discuss programmatic and then content marketing, branded content, native advertising, and so on. And these still remain uh, important pillars. Now, given the expertise of all of you uh, in this, I would like perhaps a comment on how do you see these uh, evolving in the near future, uh, the programmatic side and the branded content, native advertising, how do you see them playing out, let's say, over the next 12 months, for instance, or 18? Mylis? Um, I think they, they have a great future. Um, to, as for Vocento, for example, it's uh, what we are trying to reach is a balance between being result-driven and brand-safe. And uh, those three, I would say, even programmatic is not a format, it's a way to, 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 to purchase, but purchasing native or, 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 or video, for example, and branded content, they definitely remain a key part. And in terms of native, for example, uh, we have been uh, developing something that I think not so many publishers have, at least in Spain, but uh, in Europe as well, is actually uh, selling native local in a performance way, like exactly networks do. And this is something which is brand new that is working very nicely. But beyond that, I think 
where we have to work publishers is in the qualitative environment and going a little bit beyond what you, what you were saying, which is definitely I would sign on every chart you've been presenting. Uh, for us at Vocento now, which means it's actually um, improving also the performance of the pages where the advertising is actually placed. So uh, what does it mean? Working on user experience, uh, working on web page optimization, and, um, and I would say, uh, all, and also of course on editorial content. Uh, and this is for us also very important because the better you will be actually having this uh, environment uh, ready for that, the better will be also your advertising performing. So we are very much working on that currently. Nick, a comment from you. Embracing, I think, for, so embracing new technology. Um, it, programmatic is just the pipes at the end of the day. Programmatic's not going to go away. It's a way in which we can exchange information um, efficiently. Mm -hmm. Buyers can buy at scale and publishers can open up um, you know, maximum demand against their inventory. So that's not going away. Um, obviously, there's big, huge developments in CTV. Um, we recently made an acquisition um, around Publica, um, which are on the sell side. So we can kind of better understand what the quality issues and the efficiency issues are um, on CTV, because where the money is, is tends to be where fraud goes, tends to be where bad actors go. What we want to do is be able to kind of um, understand CTV first, um, how CTV works so we can apply the same quality um, media opportunities for publishers in that environment um, and on, on the buy side. Um, outside of that as well, to, to the point that you were making earlier, it's about optimizing exactly what you have right now. You know, having those conversations with your um, your, your, uh, your clients, your advertisers, understanding what suitability controls that they're using, um, and then ensuring that you're mirroring the same from the sales side and also in order to reduce um, block rates, improve um, viewability, so that you can actually se sell more inventory, and importantly, increase um, your quality um, CPM. Fair, the view from Ireland. The view from Ireland, okay, so um, I might start with programmatic first, so um, the open marketplace um, is, is not a significant source of revenue for us really, um, but with uh, CPMs projected to come down further due to restrictions around cookies, um, our route would be more premium deals with agencies directly, um, where, where we can layer in our unique first party data as needed, uh, that would give us a better yield for us, um, greater control of the delivery across context and audience, and better performance for advertisers. Um, and, and agreed, you know, while programmatic has its own uh, nuances, we, we do view it as a different method of trading and selling as opposed to a completely different media. Um, so all the audience, the, the context, the high quality KPIs, etc., apply here the same way um, as they do with uh, direct sold and traditionally placed business. Um, and then a, a, around native, um, I, I think that the ability really to, to offer multiple offerings suited for different size clients is really important. Um, I definitely think we, we've been guilty of, of having one sort of set template for native. And actually, um, we, we've, well, whilst we've always tried to educate um, clients around storytelling, there are just some clients that just want to use native for, for product, to sell product and don't want to tell a story. Um, so we've, we've, we've worked on that and um, we've introduced um, a few new products that, that we think work um, like interactive showcases where, where brands can showcase multiple product, products but still have a bit of content with it. Um, and then I guess um, components of larger partnerships around native, although they might be starting as, as native content partnerships, we've definitely seen the, the demand to grow those sort of native partnerships into, into real world events even. Um, uh, especially post-COVID, there's definitely an appetite to do that. So that's what we've been doing. And then extending native into podcasts and videos as, as where necessary. But I think what we're doing now is we're behaving more and more like a, like a, a media and creative agency, co-creating with um, clients um, versus a, a traditional media supplier that maybe we had been looked at in the past. Um, and also what, what I'm finding interesting is um, the demand to use influencers within native. Um, uh, that, that, that's, that's definitely uh, been, been a trend that we've seen over the last year or so. 
Um, but it's all about working with the right ones, the ones that align with the, the advertiser and the ones that align with our brand um, or title. So for example, there's, there's one campaign we're working on at the moment um, and we're using different, different influencers um, that resonate um, with the Irish Times audience um, for the same campaign. We're using another influ influencer we feel resonates more with the Irish Examiner audience. So, so and, and with those um, influencers, we, we feel that using, using those with, with trusted media platforms like ours, it's really powerful. And actually all the, um, the bench, where we'd usually ben benchmark native against um, using the influences is, is, is really outperforming that. So um, that would see a trend that I definitely see continuing. Augustin. In two words. <laughs> um, what programmatic we bring in the next 12 months, I would say scale and efficiency. Uh, we, we have to remind you why uh, programmatic was born. Programmatic was born like less than 15 years ago, so it's still a teenager, uh, to solve inefficiency of, digi of the digital monetization, some efficiency. It grew up super fast and uh, the landscape have been a bit complex, so it pushed all the media owners to uh, work with a complex web middleman. So as a consequence, we have seen that they receive multiple bids from the same advertiser and for the same impression. So we have a problem of anything she to solve. A few years ago, a few years ago, yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't move. Okay. So, <laughs> ne bouge pas. Ne bouge pas. <laughs> no, we have seen that we, we had an issue also with the buy side and they, they had some doubt uh, regarding where and how they, they, they buy uh, programmatic ads, you know, and they, they, they brought an initiative called SPO and we are facing the same type of issue regarding the other side of the market with the supply side. And so they have some doubts regarding the efficiency and the transparency. So we see an initiative called DPO, Demand Pass Optimization, that are coming now on the market. And what DPO will solve in the, the, the coming uh, weeks, uh, it, will be, it will bring more transparency uh, on the way the buyers are buying uh, media owners' uh, impression and inventory. But it will, it will, I guess, mm -hmm. it will also uh, uh, permit to identify what is the most efficient pass in between from the buyer to the seller. So efficiency, scale also because I'm deeply convinced that many different channels and creative will be now uh, brought to uh, programmatic and the more scalable way. Anthony, uh, I could ask you to answer the, qu the question in full, but you already you know, expanded on a lot of these things. So I'll ask a very targeted question. Mm -hmm. You, when it comes to branded content and native advertising, The Telegraph was the award-winning content studio, Spark, I think mm -hmm. it was called. And at some point, I think last year, you decided to put it aside and elevate the branded content level, at, uh, the branded content work at a different level where brands need to sign up to the broader editorial direction or the cause of some content. What was the thinking behind that? Um, I because it, has, it yeah. astonished a few people, uh, given of how many awards you guys had won. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think really it was, uh, I'm, so I, I'm speaking out of town slightly because I don't work within the editorial and um, integrated partnerships team. But the idea really was looking at how the evolution of that team aligned with what was going on with the brand overall. And to your point, it was really looking at having very specific brands that aligned to particular editorial agendas. So that there wasn't, and so that there wasn't ever a feeling of branded content was somehow a compromise in terms of you know sort of well, we're getting money for this and it's somehow compromising the the kind of the, the credibility of the of the editorial environment and then it enhanced it and you know that team is evolving and 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 developing um, that proposition um, to the point now where we're really focused on well you know we are a product in our own right. And so if we're going to have a branded partnership, that needs to be a true partnership. How can we bring brands on board that are genuinely going to enhance the subscriber's experience, help us drive subscriptions? Um, you know, it's no longer just about, well, we'll, we'll kind of siphon off a certain part of the website so that we can put branded content there. No, let's have a fully integrated experience where brands can genuinely be a part of, that, of the reader experience and help us drive our own strategy. Um, 
And I've probably simplified the strategy more than it should be, but ultimately that's what it's come down to, and that's, and that's why we now have our editorial integrated partnerships team. Now, I don't want to make the tired joke about Greek timekeeping, tempted as I may be. <laughs> However, uh, you know, we're running very short on time, but there's one last issue I'd like to raise where I would like all of you to give a brief and concise <laughs> answer because before Charlotte and the marketing team gets very angry with me. <laughs> and, and that is, you know, the last two years have been a lot of things, but they've also been the explosion of e-commerce. And recently, over the last few months, the buzzword and the reality, one might argue, has been retail media. So in this shifting environment, you know, drifting towards you know, commerce and, and retail media, how can publishers retain or increase the, the relevance? Because it is a seismic shift, one might argue. My lease. Briefly, everyone, by the way, as I said, thank you. Briefly to just such a very important <laughs> break of, uh, question. A minor question I posed. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be very, very brief and uh, even going straight beyond uh, retail media or e-commerce, uh, what all of this uh, says is that uh, the media now are caught in a great battlefield uh, with a big name above, which is attention. Uh, and there are two words that are really, I would say, prevailing in order to be winning in this battle. This is relevance and personalization. And uh, which means for us in Vocento, this is a completely shift in culture and in the cultural meaning, going from an advertising-centric organization to a user-centric organization. And this is, implies for us changing a uh, way of working, changing the culture, uh, and having and developing a higher data intelligence. So this would be my brief answer. With a very good point. Nick? Um, super quickly, uh, everything that we've just discussed still applies. You know, it, it absolutely still applies. And the, and the publisher still has fantastic assets. It's, out, it's about maximizing those opportunities um, and, and leaning in, focusing on efficiency, driving quality media to advertisers. And I just want to kind of make a point here that um, this isn't something we should be frightened of. And, and some businesses are doing exceptionally well. I mean, Future um, recently announced that they made one billion in sales for its retail partners by integrating it. And the commission they took from that was 216 million. That's not to be sniffed at. And I, I think as publishers, um, as, a, as, as, a, as a, 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 an ad ecosystem, we ought to be leaning into kind of new opportunities rather than being scared of them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, that's a very good point. Claire. Okay, to, to be very, very brief, and I did have a longer answer prepared for this one, but um, we do have, we've, we've launched a suite of new products actually that we call um, Shoppable. Um, and um, we've worked with the video infrastructure company seeing this. Um, so essentially the format that we've created um, allows users to view and interact with up to six products and learn more around them. Um, this format has a feature as well to direct consumers straight into the uh, advertiser's checkout page with the product directly in the basket. So we've worked on, I won't go into them all now because of time, but, but a couple of things like that that were really new to us. And just based on that, that you know, seismic shift um, and, and new shopping habits, we think these will, will work really well. But they're all really new for us and, and this is a new area for us. Well, thank you, Claire. Brief. Augusta. Yeah, in two words. Uh, probably one of the biggest opportunities for the media owners uh, because until now we are working mostly on prospect and it's a huge opportunity to bring an incremental uh, part of the, the, the advertising uh, ecosystem because they work with their own clients, their clients. So they will bring this, those opportunities to the media owners. So for me, if you add this to the signing, the logging, the unique ID, it will be probably one of the biggest incremental uh, business in the coming years for media owners. And, and we'll close as we started. Anthony. <laughs> I think very briefly, just to echo Claire's point, I think, um, you know, looking at how you can create, you know, good, rich media brand experiences within your ad units is, is crucial, and, but doing that in a responsible way. You don't have to use pop-ups and, and kind of big overlays to do that. Um, embrace them so part of we, we've also done some work we've seen this um, as well and and are really focused on shoppable formats because we don't believe that the reader should be filled to comp a compromise if they want to interact with a brand they shouldn't be taken off-site to do that 
uh, you should be able to have an entire brand experience all the way to point of sale within an ad unit. So that's the kind of the big opportunity for sure, I think. And we'll be returning to that topic, and for sure, this extra incentive, uh, not only for Interact next year, but uh, also in between. I will, I will thank you all very much. Thank you, Mylise. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Angustan. Thank you, Nick, for taking the time and your insights. I found the session incredibly interesting, and uh, we'll be returning to that topic again. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.